Cornish Euro MP Robin Teverson's talking to angry local fishermen tonight in Newlyn. Spanish access to West Country fishing grounds will be top of the agenda. Mr Teverson claims the local fleet's been sold out and says he'll take the fishermen's concerns straight to Europe. Resignations and recriminations are threatening to disrupt Labour ranks in Cornwall today. Two councillors are threatening to give up their posts because Labour chiefs insist the candidate for Falmouth and Camborne must be a woman. Jane Francis Kelly reports. Neil Kinnock was the force behind the controversial measure to have all women parliamentary shortlists, but some in the party have found it hard to accept. The woman candidate for the Falmouth and Camborne seat is to be chosen tomorrow, but the row over the shortlist has been running for some time. During last year's Labour conference in Blackpool, delegates held an emergency debate on the subject. Councillor Jim Geach says the shortlist, which included over 30 names, discriminates against men. It wasn't a secret that I wanted to go forward to uh, be the Labour candidate for Farm of Camborne. It's the area I'm, I was born in, it's the area I live in, and it's the most natural area for me to represent. However, other Labour members who fought against the all-woman rule say they're now impressed by the two final shortlisted candidates, Candy Atherton and Sue Dan. They've pledged to support whoever is selected tomorrow. Jane Francis Kelly for West Country. Now let's have a look at the weather forecast. Sheltered inland districts will have some bright spells this afternoon and it'll become mild everywhere. Temperatures reaching 10 or 11 Celsius, that's 51 Fahrenheit. Southwest facing coasts and hills will be misty with outbreaks of light drizzle here and there. The outbreaks of drizzle may become more persistent around exposed coasts and hills, but most inland areas will have a dry night. Well, that's all from me for now. Our next bulletin's at 3.25. Have a very good afternoon. I have no regrets about being where I am now. I enjoy being in this parish immensely. I enjoy my work as a priest in, in the traditional sense. I mean, lots of people, if you ask them what, what, what is a priest, they would describe a priest in the traditional sense. It's, a, it's, it's about preparing people for baptism. It's about uh, uh, being close to people when they're sick and ill and dying. It's about teaching people to say their prayers, teaching them to understand about God, teaching them to worship. It's about marrying people, preparing people for marriage. It's about uh, uh, comforting uh, the bereaved and the dying and, and burying people. It's about all those things, they would say. And lots of my colleagues would say to me um, they weren't ordained to be social workers. Um, uh, but I think priesthood is more than that. I think priesthood, uh, that, that's to put God in a kind of sacred box. And I don't think Jesus did that. I mean, Jesus, yes, he was to be found in the synagogue, and in the temple, doing the religious things. But he was also to be found out in the countryside feeding 5,000 people simply because they were hungry, not because they were going to come to church. He was about the business of giving somebody uh, back his sight because he was blind and he wanted to see. He was about um, making lepers whole so that they could come home to their families. And it seems to me that those things are as important for the church and therefore the, for the priest to be about. As, as being about the religious things. And I have no regrets. I mean, I, I enjoy being as much about trying to help people in a material way to get a better quality of, of life as to be about those things in, in, in a specifically religious way. Because I think our, our, our Lord tells us in, in, in St. John's Gospel uh, that he came that we might have life and have it to the full. And I don't think he was just talking about a narrow bit of our lives that we might be terrific at prayer whilst living in abject squalor. Lots of people in our world ignore God, and yet they still live. Um, the sun still comes up in the morning, or the rain, or whatever, um, and food is still produced, and life goes on. And I don't think that's because we can live without God. I think God isn't going to allow us to live without him. He goes on caring for us. Next week, Jill Farwell reveals why life led her to found the Children's Hospice Southwest.
This week in Getaways, we're hitting the high spots with Anne Gregg on holiday in Holland. Dropping anchor as Linda Ward explores the upper reaches of the River Fowl. And taking to the waters with Graham Purchase in the Roman resort of Bath. Plus a clicking of heels on the Costa del Sol. A touch of sunshine to banish the winter blues, Sunday at 5 on West Country. With the time at 12.30, we cross to the studios of ITN for the lunchtime news. Good afternoon. Welcome to the news from ITN. Hello. The headlines this Friday lunchtime. Police continue the murder case against Rosemary West. She's charged with the tenth murder. Social workers say videoing child abuse allegations is inefficient. Does the technique damage the children it's meant to protect? Today's other main developments. Cot death syndrome. New research says bottle-fed babies are not at increased risk. And the result of an unscheduled visit to Buckingham Palace. Police question a man who crashed his car into the gates. Within the last half hour, the Crown Prosecution Service has said it will press ahead with murder charges against Rosemary West, wife of the alleged mass murderer Frederick West. And today they charged her with a tenth murder, that of her eight-year-old stepdaughter Charmaine West. The case against Rosemary West had been thrown into doubt after her husband's death in prison. But the CPS said committal proceedings would take place next month. Rosemary West last appeared in court on Tuesday, charged then with nine murders. The further allegation concerns Charmaine West, whose body was the 11th to be recovered. Found at Midland Road in Gloucester, where the Wests lived before moving to Cromwell Street. Their police recovered nine bodies, all of them women. Frederick West was found dead in his cell on New Year's Day at Birmingham's Winsome Green Prison, and police and prosecution lawyers then began reviewing the case against his wife, who'd been jointly charged with him on nine counts of murder. Her lawyers claimed some recent newspaper reports, which went into detail about the events at Cromwell Street, had prejudiced her case. But Rosemary West is now due to appear at Dursley Magistrates Court in Gloucestershire to face ten charges of murder. This morning, Rosemary West was charged with the murder of Charmaine West between the 1st of May 1971 and the 31st of December 1971. The Crown Prosecution Service has advised us that the Crown will be pursuing the case against Rosemary West at the committal proceedings at Dursley Magistrates Court on the 6th of February. For children who've suffered sexual abuse, a further ordeal is talking about it again on camera so their evidence can be used in court. Well, today a report by social service directors says such children are being caused unnecessary distress because very little of the video evidence is ever used in court. They say the government must urgently reconsider guidelines on when the children's testimony should be filmed. Malcolm is the father of a 10-year-old girl who was sexually abused by a family friend. Her evidence was recorded on video by police, but she still had to endure the trauma of being cross-examined and accused of lying by the defence barrister when the case went to court. I think once the police have established um, a video of the child like my daughter had to make, actually um, showing uh, exactly what happened, that, to be quite un honest, is enough. In this day and age, to put a child through what my daughter had to go through in Southwark Crown Court is barbaric. But at least that case did eventually lead to a conviction. Today's report says that only 6% of video interviews with abused children are ever used in court. I think it shows that up and down the country, children have been unnecessarily uh, put through a, a process which in the end is, is unproductive, unproductive for them, unproductive for the social workers and police officers who spend so much time carrying out these interviews. Experts say the police should be more selective when deciding when to video evidence. There is need for some clarification as to the rules as to when videotapes should be made and some additional training to both police officers and social workers to detect that moment when the child is going to give the most complete account which is going to be acceptable to a court. But the police say it's necessary to record so many interviews simply because it's difficult to decide when cases will go to court until all the child's evidence has been heard. 
Well, Chief Constable Tony Butler of the Association of Chief Police Officers is in our Gloucester studio. Mr. Butler, what do you say to the basic charge that videoing these children is not only wildly inefficient but also damaging to the children? Well, I have to refute that because the evidence we have, and it's independent research, sh says there is no uh, grounds to believe that the video recording of child witness evidence adds to the trauma of these children. I think we need to understand these are very traumatic and distressing cases. But I, I must emphasise, there is no evidence that the video recording creates further difficulty. Is there a sense in which, by videoing them, you're showing them that you're taking it seriously? That is the evidence that comes back, and that was included in research that the National Children's Home published last year. Do you think the police need to be more selective about the point at which they do resort to video evidence? Well, that would seem to be uh, one option, but unfortunately, our experience shows that that isn't the case. Because one of the things that is often tested by the courts as soon as the case comes there is the defence and the judge examine the circumstances in which the police have gathered the evidence and where they have had conversations with children that are not previously video recorded. Allegations are then made of rehearsing the child, coaching the child and so on. And so in fact if we follow this uh, approach of reducing the number of video recorded evidence uh, cases we could in fact damage the interests of children by reducing the number of successful prosecutions. So I think this is a very dangerous move that's being suggested here. Mr Butler, thank you very much. Well, with me now is the NSPCC's Director of Children's Services, Jim Harding. Jim Harding, we know that video evidence was introduced to actually help abused children, but in your opinion, is it now doing more harm than good? Well, I don't think it's helping children. I think this is part of a larger issue, which is that children in this country just don't get justice. Most of the abused children that we know of, their cases never get to court at all. And for those ones where the children do manage to get in court, they're often treated in an environment which is, frankly, hostile to children. Yes, indeed, as we, as we heard in our earlier report. Well, obviously, a child does have to have his evidence taken and evaluated and ultimately tested. So in what way could this be done that would be less traumatic and equally fair to the defence? Quite. I mean, the last thing anyone wants to see is uh, a defendant wrongly charged and found guilty. But there are ways of making it more effective from a child's point of view. And what we would like to see is the introduction of pre-trial hearings. This would involve taking the evidence of a child as soon as possible after the events, making sure that that story is videoed, um, arranging for the child to be cross-examined at that time, so the child is cross-examined. And, and and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would the child at this stage be allowed to have their parents with them or somebody that they felt familiar with and be in familiar surroundings? Because the criticism is that when they're put into the video situation at the moment, they're in alien surroundings, often with nobody to support them. Yes, we've got to get the balance right, because the, the great fear is that people will coax the children and get them to say things that aren't true. But at the same time, we've got to recognise that these child have had terrible experiences and they do need to support and help. And surely what we should be seeking is the truth and enabling the children to tell their stories as truthfully as possible. Jim Harding, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, the Queen wasn't at home, but when a car crashed into the main gates of Buckingham Palace early this morning, the police couldn't afford to take any chances. They detained the driver straight away. He's still being questioned. One of the gates fell on top of the car, but the driver wasn't injured. Scotland Yard said the crash did not appear to be a deliberate breach of palace security. The Volkswagen Coupe smashed into the palace gates at 4.30 this morning. ITN understands the driver had made a 200-mile nighttime journey from an address in Yorkshire. The force of the crash tore one of the gates off its hinges. The driver was not injured. He's understood to be in his 20s and was immediately arrested. He was breath tested but passed. The car was later hauled away for examination, notes for a journey by road clearly visible on the driver's seat. Engineers have begun assessing the damage to the elegant Edwardian gates. They will take many weeks and thousands of pounds to repair. A mile away at Charing Cross police station, a doctor is due to examine the driver. In the last five years, police have dealt with two other very similar incidents. In both cases, the drivers were dealt with under the Mental Health Act. Palace security was stepped up 13 years ago after Michael Fagan broke in and sat on the Queen's bed. In 1993, security questions were raised again when a group of anti-nuclear protesters scaled the palace walls. They were able to get in using just step ladders and wire cutters. And last year, an American parachutist, James Miller, descended onto the roof of the palace. Police say today's incident was not malicious. It has, at least, provided something of an unusual attraction for tourists.
Howell Jones, ITN, Buckingham Palace. Russia has again come under fire for its military offensive in Chechnya, this time on two fronts, from the American Secretary of State Warren Christopher and from the Council of Europe, which promotes human rights and democracy. Fierce fighting in the capital Grozny is still going on. Western military analysts expect a final major assault on the city within the next 48 hours. Russian artillery have again been shelling the center of Grozny in an attempt to pound the Chechens into submission. But several hundred Chechen fighters continue to hold the presidential palace, which is of enormous symbolic significance in their defiance of the Russian army. The barrage has been intense, and among those caught up in it were a Sky television crew. The crew's Russian sound recordist was wounded by shrapnel. The rest of the team escaped injury. Western analysts say the Russians are pouring reinforcements into the region about 40,000 of their troops are now involved in the operation against an estimated two to 3,000 Chechen defenders. The Russians have already underestimated the Chechens' determination to fight on, but the analysts believe the fall of Grozny is inevitable, perhaps now only a matter of days, though subduing the entire country will take many months. Well, for the latest from Grozny, I spoke to Julian Mannion a short time ago, and I asked him if the final push to take the city had already started. Well, we don't know that yet, but what I can tell you is that I am standing in front of a hospital on the southern outskirts of Grozny, and a constant stream of casualties is coming here. Right in front of me is the Lada car out of which one wounded Chechen soldier has been taken and is now being carried at the run into the hospital. And behind it is a truck, normally the sort of truck that you'd carry cement in, and people are clambering all over the back of it to bring out more wounded people, both soldiers and civilians. Now, we've just come here from one of the central areas of the city, and minutes before we arrived there, Russian aircraft struck it. That's one of the, one of the main roundabouts. Russian aircraft struck it with missiles, setting two apartment blocks on fire and wounding several people. And uh, be beyond that, down the other end of what is called Freedom Avenue, Russian shells were striking the center of the city at a ferocious rate. Shells of all kinds whistling in, and in between them, in between the sound of their explosions, the sounds of heavy machine gun fire, of tank fire, RPG, those rocket grenades going off, and uh, really firing of all descriptions. Julian, have you any information about Russian troop movements and reports that a better caliber of troops are being moved in? Well, uh, there are constant reports that Russian re reinforcements are being sent in, but of course from the Chechen side we don't see any of them. All, the, all that we are aware of is the sounds of the fighting and sometimes the actual sight of the fighting. And clearly today there has been a, a, a very serious shelling of the central area of Grozny and of some residential areas and also some heavy ground fighting. That was absolutely clear. Julian Mannion in Grozny, thank you very much. Women who bottle-fed their babies instead of breastfeeding them have over the years been told they may be putting their child at risk of cot death, but not anymore. The latest research published in the British Medical Journal says bottle-fed babies are no more susceptible to the cot death syndrome. Smoking near the baby is still a much more likely cause. For mothers like Sarah Howe, who lost a baby through cot death, the new findings come as a relief. She bottle-fed baby Sam, who died when he was nine weeks old, and has agonised over whether this was a factor. People's comments were, oh, if you had breastfed, it might not have happened. Um, and when people say that to you, you just feel like it makes, just makes you really angry. Figures showed that bottle-fed babies were two or three more times likely to die than breastfed infants. But researchers have found that those babies were more likely to have had parents who smoked. I think the most important message is to avoid cigarette smoking completely, if possible, from the moment you're pregnant through at least to the end of the baby's first year. And that applies to mums and dads. This research really confirms our practice that uh, we can't recommend breastfeeding as a means of preventing cot death, but we've always recommended breastfeeding as just general good infant care practice. The campaign to lay babies on their backs has led to an 80% fall in cot death in the last five years. Doctors still say breastfeeding has long-term benefits to a child's health, but the new findings should settle one question about cot death, which has puzzled scientists for years. The Prime Minister is holding top-level talks with Cabinet Ministers at Chequers about the direction of future government policy. 
and it looks like Mr Major will be without a Commons majority for the foreseeable future. Several of the Tory Euro rebel MPs said today they'd resist attempts to woo them back into the party fold. Senior ministers are at Chequers today with John Major for a strategic brainstorming session. What's described as a long-range overview of Britain's place in the world, trade and defence policy. A welcome break, no doubt, from domestic politics. An opinion poll today suggesting another record lead for Labour. 88% of those polled viewing the Conservatives as divided. It's reported that some of the Tory rebels may return to the fold. Poppycock says Theresa Gorman after claims the government will this month invite back some of the backbenchers who lost the Conservative whip. A Commons vote next week on fisheries policy is seen as an important test of the rebels' loyalty. They may again refuse to support the government over plans to allow the Spanish fleet into British waters. Yet ministers are offering a hand of friendship to the rebels. On Wednesday, Sir Teddy Taylor receiving an assurance they wouldn't be barred from Commons committees. If we are doing this, will there be no veto? Uh, I, 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 can, I can certainly give my honourable friend the assurance that there will be no veto. One cabinet minister has said privately that the rebels will certainly be allowed back by Easter. But one of them has said they're standing together. The government won't succeed in picking them off and inviting back a few at a time. QPIM, ITN, Westminster. Tracy Mertens died from horrific burns on the steps of a church in Congleton, Cheshire on Christmas Eve. She'd been covered in petrol and set alight. Today, a man appeared in court accusing of, accused of conspiring to murder 31-year-old Tracy. Derek Johnson arrived in court in a wheelchair. His solicitor said he was injured by police during his arrest. Derek Johnson arrived at court in the back of an ambulance. Nursing injuries to his neck and arms, he had to be wheeled into the dock. His lawyer claimed the injuries were sustained when Johnson was arrested. A complaint is being made to West Midlands Police. The 29-year-old man is charged with conspiring to murder Tracy Martins, who was abducted, doused in petrol and set alight. Tracy was snatched from her home in Birmingham just before Christmas and taken on a terrifying 60-mile journey to Cheshire. It was on the steps of this church that Tracy had petrol poured over her. Her abductors left her to die, but she survived in agony for 12 hours before dying in hospital. Police say the two men who abducted Tracy had told her they were looking for her common-law husband. Johnson appeared in court flanked by five police officers. He said nothing during the brief hearing apart from to confirm his name and address. There was no application for bail and he was remanded in custody for a week. Richard Cook, ITN, Macclesfield. Britain imported more than it exported again in October, £644 million pounds more in fact. So the country went even further into the red than in September. Despite this, the government says exports are higher than ever. At the forefront of the export drive are some of our most traditional industries. Whiskey has been produced in Scotland for 500 years. And in this anniversary year, distillers J&B have launched a new blend using 128 different whiskies. Because they've seen its development as a blender's ultimate challenge, they've called it Ultima. It's likely that most bottles will go abroad. Only 2% of J&B's sales are in Britain. Nearly 90% of the Scotch whisky industry's business, and my own company's is even greater, is down to exports. And so if we don't export, we die. And it's companies like J&B that are helping Britain pay its way in the world. Over the past year, the trade deficit has narrowed. And although October's deficit of 644 million was worse than September's, it was still about 200 million better than a year earlier. Whiskey is undoubtedly one of Britain's key exports, but it's not the only one. Our chemicals and pharmaceuticals companies are very successful, and our car industry, helped by Japanese investment, is also contributing to Britain's recovery. Manufacturing industry is doing pretty well. Uh, our output is up. Uh, by between three and four percent over the over the year uh, and uh, this is very much export led so for companies like JMB business is looking pretty good their exports are doing well and exports are generally driving this recovery but for many people outside the exporting sector life isn't so good it's no wonder the feel-good factor remains so elusive Ruth Lee ITN Central London the livestock plane which crashed in Coventry, killing five people, was flying illegally. The Department of Transport said today that the Boeing 737, which was leased by Phoenix Aviation to fly veal calves abroad for slaughter, did not have a permit to carry them. A 
full investigation is being carried out into the crash. The Princess of Wales has again been promoting the work of charities for the homeless. She spent this morning at a new cold weather shelter in London's Leicester Square. She met staff from the charity Centrepoint, which had set up the shelter for homeless young people. It opens officially this evening. The princess was shown the kitchen, which will provide food for up to 35 young people. She paid a private visit to the charity's first cold weather centre in King's Cross last week. The Yorkshire fast bowler Darren Goff put a smile back on the faces of England's long-suffering cricket fans. First he proudly showed off his new son for the cameras, then he said he hoped to be back from injury in time to face the West Indies this summer. Darren Goff, back home in his native Yorkshire, reunited at Headingley with his wife and the six-week-old baby son he'd just seen for the first time. Liam was born on the first day of the first test in Australia. His wife Anna was preparing to fly out with the baby when Darren collapsed. He could have stayed on, but it's not in his nature to sit on the bench. I'm not the type of person who can sit and watch cricket. Um, I like to do other things and I just wanted to get, get away from it. I don't want to be sat out there wishing I was out there playing. I'd rather be at home. He's six, seven weeks old now um, and to see him for the first time it was great. I've only seen him on a picture and to see him in, in flesh is really good. I'm very proud. And his county are proud of the talent unearthed by the Yorkshire Cricket Academy. Darren, of course, is the first product of that academy to play for England. He came to the academy as a YTS boy, and there are many following him on the conveyor belt of talent. And providing the injury heals in time, he can't wait to face the West Indies this summer. The first test is on his home ground. In the city, news of the wider trade gap snuffed out whatever enthusiasm there was in the market. A short time ago, the FT100 index was down 16 points. The pound was down a touch against the dollar. It was up just over a fennec against the German mark. And the main headlines again. The Crown Prosecution Service has said it will press ahead with the murder charges against Rosemary West, the wife of Frederick West, despite his death in prison. And today they charged her with a tenth murder, that of her eight-year-old stepdaughter, Charmaine West. A new report says children who have been sexually abused have to undergo more, sometimes unnecessary, distress in making video recordings of evidence. Social service directors who work with children say only one in 17 of such interviews ever gets used in court. And police are questioning a man who drove his car into the gates of Buckingham Palace. The force of the collision knocked one of the gates off its hinges. And that's it for now. The next main news from ITN is at 5.40 with John Suchet. But from the two of us, goodbye and have a very good weekend. Goodbye. Good afternoon. Well, generally speaking, our weather's getting mild, in the short term at least. Now, what we have at the moment is a warm front pushing down across the country, feeding in that warmer air behind it. By the end of today, that'll have virtually disappeared off the scene, and so it'll be mild throughout the whole of the country. Now, come tomorrow, however, we have a reversal of this process. There we see a cold front now appearing on the scene, and that in turn sinking southwards, getting as far south as round about the north of England by the end of tomorrow, and in turn that cooler air feeding in behind. Now back to today, very much a cloudy scene, patchy rain and drizzle around, especially for western coasts, as well as some of those hills. If it's sunshine you're after this afternoon, your very best bet is sheltered parts of the northeast of England, as well as Northern Ireland, getting faintly brighter, and the east of Scotland. With temperatures certainly taking their time to recover in the southeast, pegged back to 7 or 45 here, generally speaking 9 or 10, but windy with it, especially in the very far northwest. Here's the weather summary. <laughs> When the hunting and shooting set gets involved in something more serious... They shall not pass. It's time to watch your step. Clean your shoes before you go. Jack Frost. Straight on the scent like a bloodhound. 
that because his great 